The Croquet Player by H.G. Wells Part 2 The Haunting Fear in Cain's Marsh It was while I was sitting out on the terrace in the sun, nibbling a brioche and consuming a harmless vermouth and seltzer, that I first set eyes on Dr. Finchatton. He was two tables away and was having an almost violent quarrel with a number of books he'd got from the Les Nupes Tea Shop and Lending Library. He was opening them, one after another, reading a few pages, turning them over, muttering and banging them down on the ground with an emphasis that would have distressed the library people extremely. He looked up and caught my reproving eye. He stared and then smiled. Scores of books, he said. Hundreds of books. And not one worth reading. They're all off it. There was something comical and irrational about his disgust that amused me. Then why read them, I asked. Reading crowds the memory and prevents one thinking. Exactly what I want to do. I came over here to stop thinking and forget. And I can't. His voice, which to begin with was clear and distinct, rose to an angry note. Some of these books bore, some irritate, some even remind me of just what I'm trying to forget. Stepping over his heap of condemned volumes, he came, glass and carafe in hand, and without any invitation from me, sat down at the table beside me. He looked me in the face with an expression that was at once friendly and slightly quizzical. I know my face is, well, cherubic, for a man of thirty-three, and it was very evident he appreciated the fact. Do you do much thinking? he asked. A fair amount. I solve the Times crossword puzzle nearly every day. I play a lot of chess, by correspondence chiefly, and I'm not so bad at bridge. I, I mean real thinking, about things that pursue and worry you, and cannot be explained. I don't let things worry me, I said. Do you happen to be interested in ghosts and hauntings? I'm neutral. I don't believe in ghosts, but I don't disbelieve in them. If you follow me, I've never seen a ghost. I think there's a lot to be said for spiritualism, quite a lot, in spite of much imposture. I suppose immortality has been proved now by that sort of thing, and that is all to the good. My aunt, Miss Frobisher, is quite of that opinion. But I feel that the necessary table wrapping and cabinet seances and all that is a job for a specialist. But suppose you found there were ghosts all about you. I never have. And there's nothing, here for instance, that makes you feel uneasy. Where? I asked. There, he said, and waved a hand at the tranquil sea and the innocent sky. Why should there be? But is there? No. I envy your insensitiveness, or your imperturbability. He emptied his glass and ordered another half-litre of wine. Either out of ignorance or preference, he was drinking red ordinaire. You don't feel there is anything, no danger. I never saw a more tranquilizing view, not a cloud. It isn't so with me. I've had some very disturbing experiences. I'm still disturbed, curious. You feel nothing. Maybe it's just the aftermath of what has happened. What has happened? And what is the aftermath? I'd like to tell you, he said. It's rather a yarn, you know. Go ahead, I said. And with that much introduction, he began to tell me his story. He was rather disconnected at first, and then he settled down to it. He told it to me, not as though he particularly wished to tell it to me, but as though he wanted very badly to tell it to someone and hear how it sounded. After he'd got started, I interrupted very little. It was indiscreet of me, perhaps, to let him begin upon me. I knew nothing of him. I had to ask him for his name before he named himself. Evidently he was queer in some way. I should have remembered that the big house above the town was supposed to be a home for mental cases, a psychotherapeutic institution, as they called them nowadays. And the discreet thing for me would have been to have sheared off there and then upon some excuse before his story began. Yet there was nothing about him to warn me of him. There was nothing eccentric in his manner, or indeed in his general appearance. He had the jaded look of a man who doesn't sleep well, a little dark under the eyes. But apart from that, he seemed quite all right. 
He was quietly dressed in the Englishman's usual grey. He wore a coloured shirt and an unobtrusive tie. It was a little askew, but that was nothing. Plenty of men never put on their ties straight, though how they can stand it I can't think. It is so easy to get a tie straight. He was decidedly lean, fairly good-looking, with what I suppose one would call a sensitive mouth below his short moustache. He leant forward most of the time, with his arms folded under his chest, much as a cat folds up its paws. He talked, perhaps, just a little on the emphatic side, but he seemed on the watch to control himself. And as I had a full hour or more to dispose of before I went down to Les Nupes again, I let him run on without any attempt to interrupt him or cut him short. At first, he said, I thought it was the marshes. What marshes? Cain's Marsh. You have heard of Cain's Marsh? I used to be pretty good at geography at school, but I couldn't recall that name. But I didn't like to admit my ignorance on the spur of the moment. Something about the word seemed familiar. Marsh seemed a clue. Vague suggestions of fenny country, watery expanses, alluring sky, dank black thatch, moored old barges, and the hum of mosquitoes floated across my mind. A great district for malaria and rheumatic complaints, he said, confirming my impression. I bought a practice there. Forgive a touch of autobiography. I did so partly because it was an exceptionally cheap practice, and I had to earn a living somehow with my small resources, and partly because I wanted to leave the hospital and London and rest my brain. I went there jaded and disappointed. It seemed likely to be an easy-going job. There's practically no competition in the marshes not until you get towards the part they call the island, where the market town doctors come out in their cars. The parishes up towards the hills, and such as they are, and out towards the saltings are quite beyond their range, except for special consultations. I had to go into practice with a minor qualification, because of the need I was under for tranquilizing surroundings. I threw up the prospect of a medical degree. He paused, as though he found a difficulty. "'Were you ill?' I inquired, to help him out. "'Why did you leave the hospital with a minor qualification? "'Forgive me for making a personal remark, "'but you don't look the sort of man who muffs exams.' "'I didn't muff exams. "'In fact, I was more than usually ambitious. "'I worked, I think, too hard, "'and I was active mentally in other directions. "'I was keener on politics than most medical students.' And I got a very keen on social justice and the prevention of war, very keen on the war question. I'd been working on gas. Perhaps I did too much. Perhaps I thought and felt too much. Yes, yes, certainly I felt too much. A time came when the morning paper could upset me so as to spoil my work for the day. From the very beginning of my medical education, you must know that I found myself under a strain. I admit that uh, I didn't like dissection. I didn't like the damaged human stuff in the wards. Some of it was pitiful. Some of it horrified me. I agreed with him. Doctoring has always terrified me. I couldn't stand any of it. But the world must have doctors, he said. It won't have me for a doctor. I've never seen more than three dead people, and they were all lying quietly out on the bed. But on the road, you come upon dreadful sights. We never travel by road. All sane people are giving it up. You, I see, have avoided the ugly side of life from the first. Well, I didn't. I walked right into it when I chose medicine. I thought of the good I could do, and I never thought of the harsh, red realities I should have to face. You avoided. I tried not to avoid, and then I ran away. I went to that district with a full idea of escape. This, I told myself, will be away from any war there is, or any bombing. Here I can recover myself. Here, I said, there will be nothing except normal cases I can really face and help. Cain's Marsh is far from any main roads. There won't even be motor casualties, which are often so frightful to encounter. You see my point? It looked as good as any possible world for me. Then going there in summer time with the wild flowers out, and a hundred sorts of butterfly about, dragonflies, and an abundance of summer birds, let alone a lot of summer visitors, mostly houseboat and fishing people with children and their small ailments, they didn't seem to be very much wrong with it. 
I would have laughed if you told me that I'd come into a haunted land. I did all I could to protect myself from overstimulation. I didn't have a newspaper in the house. I relied upon a weekly news summary with no illustrations but diagrams. I wouldn't open a book later than Dickens. The native population seemed at first just a trifle stupid and reserved, but quite kindly. I saw nothing wrong with them, to begin with. Old Rawdon, the vicar of Cross in Slackness, that landmark church of the levels, told me that there was a good deal of furtive drugging because of the ague, and that he suspected the genuineness of their amiability. I went to pay my respects to him as soon as I was able. He was an elderly man, and rather deaf, and he'd exchanged to the cross in slackness living because of his infirmity. Uh, his church and vicarage were stranded, so to speak, with one or two cottages on a sort of crocodile back of land, and they were overgrown with elm trees. I doubt if even as many as a score of people came to his services. He wasn't very communicative. His old, bent wife was even less so. He had trouble with gallstones and an ulcerated contusion of the ankle, and his chief preoccupation seemed to be with the high church tendencies of his fellow priest, a newly arrived curate at Marsh Havering. Apparently he himself was low church and Calvinistic. But at first I couldn't understand the mixture of fear and resentment with which he spoke of the younger man. There were no landed gentry in Canesmarsh, and except for a veterinary surgeon, a few elementary teachers, one or two publicans, and some middle-class boarding-house keepers towards Beacon Ness, the population was entirely one of farmers and farm workers. They had no folklore, no songs, no arts, and no special costume. A more improbable soil for anything you'd call psychic it would be hard to imagine. And yet, you know... He frowned and spoke in measured words, as if he was doing his utmost to be explicit, and was reasoning against the possible objections I might presently make to what he had to tell me. After all, it is in just such a flat, still atmosphere, perhaps, translucent, gentle-coloured, that things lying below the surface, things altogether hidden in more eventful and colourful surroundings, creep on our perceptions. He paused drank a glass of his wine, reflected for a moment, and resumed. There can be no disputing the stillness of that district. Sometimes I would stop my car on one of the winding dyke roads and stand listening before I went on again. One would hear the sheep upon the lavender-coloured hills four or five miles away, or the scream of some distant waterfowl, or the sound of the wind and the sea a dozen miles away at Beacon Ness, like the world breathing in its sleep. At night, of course, there were more noises. Dogs howled and barked in the distance. Corncrakes called, and things rustled in the reeds. And yet the nights, too, could sometimes have a stillness. At first, it did not seem to be of any particular significance that the traceable consumption of soporifics and opiates by this apparently insensitive population was not only quite remarkably high, but increasing, nor that the proportion of suicides and inexplicable crimes, inexplicable as distinguished from normally motivated offences, over this part of the world was exceptional and apparently rising. Dealing with such a small population, however, a murder, more or less, could upset the percentage altogether. Face to face in the daylight, there was nothing at all murderous in the bearing of these people, they didn't look you in the eye, but that may have been their idea of good manners. It just happened that there'd been no less than three crazy murders of relations and neighbours in Cain's Marsh in the past five years, and two of them, the perpetrators, were still undiscovered. The other was a fratricide. The vicar, when I spoke about this, said something about degenerate race, too inbred, and changed the subject as though it was an unpleasant topic of no particular importance for him. The first real intimation I had in my own person of the brooding strangeness that hangs over Cain's Marsh was an attack of insomnia. Hitherto I had been a fairly sound sleeper, but before I'd settled in the marsh for a couple of months, my nights began to be troubled. I would wake up in a state of profound uneasiness and 
without any physiological cause that I could trace, I fell a prey to evil dreams. They were quite peculiar dreams, like none I'd ever dreamt before. They were dreams of, of menace, of being waylaid, stalked and pursued, and of furious struggles to defend myself. Dreams out of which I'd wake shouting, you know, those faint shadowy shouts of dreamland conflict, sweating and trembling in every limb. Some of these dreams had so strong a flavour of horror that they would leave me afraid to go to sleep again. I would try to read, and whatever I read in the night watches, an eerie discomfort hung over me. I adopted all the expedients that would naturally occur to a young medical man to end these enervating experiences, but without avail. I dieted, I exercised, I would get up and dress, go out either on foot or in my car, in spite of a strong fear resistance. Fear pursued me out of those dreams. The nightmare quality hung about me and could not be shaken off. I was awake and still dreaming. Never have I seen such sinister skies as I did on those night excursions. I felt such a dread of unfamiliar shadows as I hadn't known even in childhood. There were times on those nocturnal drives when I could have shouted aloud for daylight, as a man suffocating in a closed chamber might shout for air. Very naturally, this inability to sleep began presently to undermine my daily life. I became nervous and fanciful. I found I was giving way to minor hallucinations, rather, I suppose, after the pattern of delirium tremens. But with more menace in them, I would turn convulsively under the impression that a silent hound was creeping up to attack me from behind, or I would imagine a black snake wriggling out from under the valance of an armchair. Presently came other symptoms of relaxing mental control. I found myself suspecting the island doctors of a combination against me. The most petty incidents, small slights, breaches of etiquette, fancied imputations, had been seized upon by my imagination and worked up into the fabric of a conspiracy mania. I had to restrain myself from writing foolish letters or making challenges and asking questions. Then I began to find something evil in the silence or in the gestures of some of my patients, and while I sat by their bedsides I fancied that there were hostile goings to and fro and malignant whisperings and conspirings just outside the door. I couldn't understand what was the matter with me. I searched my mind for nervous stresses, and I could find none. I had surely left all that behind in London. Temperature and so forth remained normal, but clearly there was something askew in my adjustment to these new surroundings. Cain's Marsh was disappointing my expectations. There was no healing in it for me. I had to pull myself together, I'd sunk all my little capital in the practice, and I had to stick it. There was nowhere else for me to go. I had to keep my head and grapple with this trouble and beat it before it became too much for me. Was it just my own trouble? Was something specially wrong with me, or was it something wrong with the countryside? Were there other people in the marsh having dreams and fancies like mine? Or maybe was this a trouble that came to newcomers and passed away? Was it something I should get over, a sort of acclimatization? I had to be careful with my inquiries, because it is not well for a doctor to admit he is out of sorts. I began to watch my patients, my old servant, anyone with whom I came in contact, for any betrayal of symptoms similar to mine. And I found what I looked for. Beneath the superficial stolidity, a number of these people were profoundly uneasy. There was fear in the marsh for them, as for me. It was an established, habitual fear, but it was not a definite fear. They feared something unknown. It was a sort of fear that might concentrate at any time upon anything whatever and transform it into a thing of terror. Let me give you some instances. One evening I found an old lady stiff with dread at a shadow in a corner, and when I moved her candle and the shadow moved, she screamed aloud. But it can't hurt you, I argued. I'm afraid, she answered, as though that was a sufficient answer. And suddenly, before I could prevent her, she'd seized a little clock on the night table beside her and flung it at that dark and dreadful nothingness and buried her head under the clothes. I will confess that for a moment or so I stood rigid 
and expectant, staring at the broken clock in the corner. And one day I saw a farmer, who was rabbit-shooting, pause, stare aghast at a fluttering scarecrow, and then, unaware of my presence, suddenly raise his gun and blow the poor dangling old rapscallion to bits. There was an unusual terror of the dark. My old servant, I found, would not venture out after twilight to the pillar-box a hundred yards away. She would make every sort of excuse, and when she was cornered, she absolutely refused to go. I had to go myself, or leave my letters until the morning. Even sweethearting, I learnt, would not tempt the young people abroad after sundown. I can't tell you, he said, how the perception of the presence of fear grew upon me and grew upon me, how it infected me, until at last the flap of a window blind in the breeze or the fall of a cinder in the fireplace would set my nerves a-quiver. I could not shake this off. My nights got worse. I determined to have a real talk about this queer uneasiness of the mind with the old vicar. In his way, you see, the district was his business, as in my way it was mine. He ought to know whatever was to be known. By this time the disorder was getting a strong hold upon me. I made up my mind to go to him after a night of exceptional horror and dismay. I was indeed already pretty bad. I can recall here and now the unprotected feeling of my drive to him across the open marshes. They seemed to me far too open, bare to endless dangers. And yet, when I came near a clump of trees or bushes, it took on the quality of an ambush. The normal confidence of a living creature was deserting me. I felt not simply exposed to incalculable evils, I felt threatened by them. In broad daylight, mind you, in the sunshine, with nothing but a few birds in sight. As it happened, I caught the old man in a communicative mood. I put my questions plainly to him. I'm a newcomer in this country, I said. Is there something, something peculiarly wrong about it? He stared at me and scratched his cheek, weighing what he should tell me. Yes, he said, there is. He led me into his study, listened for a moment as if to make sure that everyone was out of earshot, and then closed the door carefully. You're sensitive, he said. You're getting it sooner than I did. There's something wrong, wrong and getting worse. Something evil. I remember those opening words very plainly, and his bleary old eyes and the bad teeth in his sagging mouth. He came and sat down quite close to me, with one long bony hand cupping his hairy ear. Don't speak too loud, he said. If you speak distinctly, I can hear. He said he was glad to have someone to talk to, someone to talk it over with at last. He told me how he'd hoped to end his days in the marsh quietly and how gradually this shadowy discomfort had come over him, deepening slowly into fear. He could never afford another exchange. He too was fixed. It was hard to talk about. His wife would never talk to him about it. Before they came to cross in slackness, they had been the best of friends and gossips. Now, he said, it is pushing us apart. I have to talk to myself. I don't know what's come over her. What is pushing you apart? I asked the evil. That was his name for it. Everyone, he said, was being pushed apart. You began to find sinister possibilities in the most ordinary relations. Lately, he'd had a curious suspicion of his food. He fancied a, a queer taste in it, and queer feelings after it. It makes me fear for my reason, he said, my reason or hers. Yet, all the same, it was queer about the food. Why should anyone... He left it at that. At his first coming, the common people had seemed simply dull to him. Then he'd begun to realise that they were not so much dull as reserved and suspicious. You would catch a glance in their eyes like a dog that may snap. Even the children, when you came to watch them, were furtively defensive. For no reason. For no reason at all. He told me that, sitting very close to me, not speaking too loud. He came closer. They are cruel to animals, he told me. They beat their dogs and horses, not regularly, by fits. The children come to school with marks on them, he said. You can't get them to say anything. They're afraid. I asked him if he felt that this thing, 
whatever it was, was increasing. Had it always been there? There was very little recorded history of the region. He thought it was increasing. Things had not always been like this. I suggested that it may have always been in the atmosphere of the place, and that we became more aware of it as we fell under the spell. Maybe partly that, said the old vicar. He gave some broken fragments of a story about a former incumbent. He and his wife had been sent to prison for cruelty to a servant girl. Prison. They said she told lies and had dirty habits as an excuse. They wanted to cure her, they said, but really they just hated her. Never anything against them before they came into the marsh. It's always been here whispered the old vicar, always, below the surface, an unhappy, wicked spirit that creeps into us all. I pray. I don't know what would happen to me if I didn't pray. What with the waste of money and the rudeness of everybody, and the malicious mischief they do to me, and the stone-throwing, let alone the poison. It's the poisoning hurts me most. We talk like that in his big, shabby, sparely furnished study in the broad daylight, like men who cower in a cave. And then he began to talk less sanely. The evil was in the soil, he declared, underground. He laid great stress on the word underground. He made a downward gesture with his quivering hand. There was something mighty and dreadful buried in Cain's marsh, something colossally evil, broken up, scattered all over the marsh. I think I know what it is, he whispered darkly, but for a time he would not explain. They keep on stirring it up, he said, they would not let it rest. Whom did he mean by they? That was difficult. There had been road-making, there have been drainage works, and now those archaeologists. And that was not all. There had been a ploughing of old pastures during the war, opening old sores. You see, all over the place was once a wilderness of graves. Tumuli? I questioned. No, he insisted. Graves, graves, everywhere. And some of the ancient people, he said, were petrified. You found stones of the strangest shapes, abominable shapes. They keep on bringing things up, he said. Things that had better be left alone, ought to be let alone, making doubts and puzzles, destroying faith. At a jump he was denouncing Darwinism and evolution. It was remarkable how lifelong controversies had interwoven with his Keynes Marsh distresses. Had I seen the museum at East Folk, he asked. He talked of the great bones exhibited there. But I protested he was thinking of the bones of mammoths and dinosaurs and such like things. Giants, he insisted. Look at what they call implements there, too big and clumsy for any living man to handle. Axes, spears, nothing but huge weapons for killing and killing. Murder stones, he called them, the murder stones of giants. He clenched his bony fist, his quavering voice rose, and real hatred came into his eyes. Nothing is too bad, he said, for the men who dig up those bones, tearing up dark secrets. A grave's a grave, and a dead man's a dead man, even if he's been dead a million years. Let the evil creatures lie. Let them lie. Let their dust lie. He ceased to be furtively confidential. His anger rose and thrust his fear aside. He no longer troubled to listen to anything I had to say and reply to him. He was soon launched upon the wildest diatribe. He was transfigured by an anger that shook his feeble frame. He had fixed upon the local archaeologists and naturalists as the chief objective for his tirade. But mixed up with that, in the oddest and most illogical way, was his detestation of the high church practices that had been introduced by the new man at Marsh Havering. Just when this evil was being released and rising like an exhalation from the earth, when the one supreme need of the time was religion, straight and stern, straight and stern, he repeated, and shook his fingers in my face, this man must come with his vestments and images and music and mummery, but I will not give you an imitation of that poor old wreck as he grew fiercer and louder and hoarser. He wanted suppression, he wanted persecution of science, of Rome, of every sort of immorality and immodesty, 
of every sort of creed except his own, persecution and forced repentance to save us from the wrath that was coming steadily upon us. They turn up the soil, they strip things bare, and we breathe the dust of long dead men. It was as if he was trying to escape from our common marshland obsession by sheer screaming violence. The doom of Cain, he shouted, the punishment of Cain. But why Cain, I managed to insert. He ended his days here, the old man declared. Oh, I know. Is this called Cain's Marsh for nothing? He wandered over the face of the earth, and at last he came here. Here and the worst of his sons. They poisoned the earth, age after age, of crime and cruelty. And then the flood buried them under these marshes, and where they ought to stay buried forever. I tried to argue against this fantasy. Cain's Marsh is just a corruption of Gaines Marsh, as the guidebooks say. It's written Gaines in Doomsday Book. But the old man bore me down. My voice had no chance now amidst his croaking assertions. His deafness was a shield against all argument. His voice filled the room. He poured out the festering accusations of his brooding solitude. His sentences had the readiness of long, matured expressions. I guess most of it had been uttered time and again to the faithful remnant of the cross in Slackness Church. He'd got the children of Cain, and the cavemen, and the mammoths, and Megatheria, and dinosaurs, all jumbled up in the wildest confusion. It was a storm of preposterous nonsense. And yet, and yet, you know, Dr. Finchatton regarded the bay of Les Nupes in silence for a few moments. Out of it all came a suggestion. I doubt if it will seem remotely sane to you in this clear air. But it was the suggestion that this haunting something was something remote, archaic, bestial. He nodded his head in doubtful confirmation of what he was saying. You see, it's bad enough to be haunted by Georgian ghosts, Stuart ghosts, Elizabethan ghosts, ghosts in armour and ghosts in chains. Yet anyhow, one has a, a sort of fellow feeling for them. They aren't just spirits of cruelty, suspicion and ape-like malice. But the souls of a tribe of cavemen might be uh, grisly ghosts. What do you think? One may be as possible as the other, I said. Yes, and yet if cavemen, why not apes? Suppose all our ancestors rose against us. Reptiles, fish, amoebae. The idea was so fantastic that, as I drove away from Cross in Slackness, I tried to laugh. Dr. Finchatton stopped short and looked at me. I couldn't laugh, he said. I don't think I could have done, I said. It's a frightful idea. I'd rather be haunted by a man than an ape any day. I drove back home more saturated with terror than I came. I was beginning to see visions now everywhere. There was an old man bending down in a ditch, doing something to a fallen sheep, and he became a hunched, bent, and heavy-jawed savage. I did not dare look to see what he was doing, and when he called something to me, maybe only a good day to you, I pretended not to hear. Whenever a clump of bushes came near the road, my heart sank and I slackened pace, and, as soon as I was past, I jammed down the accelerator. I got drunk, sir, for the first time in my life that night. You see, it was either getting drunk or running away. Maybe I'm still a young doctor, but that's my code. A doctor who quits his practice, without notice, is as bad as a sentinel who bolts. So, you see, I had to get drunk. Before I went to bed, I found I was funking opening the front door to look out. So, with a convulsive effort, I flung it open wide. There crouched the marshes, under the moonlight, and the long, low mists seemed to have stayed there drifting at the slam of the door against the wall, as if they paused to listen, and over it all was something, a malignant presence, such as I'd never apprehended before. Nevertheless, I stuck to my doorstep. I did not retreat. I attempted even a drunken speech. I forget what I said. Maybe I myself went far enough back to the Stone Age to make mere inarticulate sounds, but the purport was defiance of every evil legacy the past has left for man.